we have a backup. I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Richard Smith of the Philosophia Institute Foundation, president of that foundation. But I wanted to give a little bit of background on Dr. Smith and, uh, and then have him talk more about his life and how he got to this place. And so Dr. Smith got his undergraduate work at uh, Un University of California in Berkeley, his PhD in system science, and his dissertation was on generalized information theory. And uh, he has studied complexity science, neural networks, genetic algorithms, and did some of his study at the Santa Fe Institute and looking at dynamical systems and systems thinking. And uh, right now he is also an entrepreneur helping people be better investors. And he has a long background in all of these areas. And so I wanna hear more about what you're doing now, Dr. Smith, but also how you came to this place of being president of the Philosophia Institute Foundation, which is representing the work of Wolfgang Smith. And uh, very eager to hear your story. And since you and I met via Wolfgang Smith, and we've sort of met via the internet, I'm also interested in your perspective on what we in this little corner call the meaning crisis, and how you think that your work at the foundation might be addressing that. Thanks, Karen. That was great. And it's great to be here. Uh with you and in, in your little corner of the internet, as you call it. So, um, you know, for me, Wolfgang's work, Wolfgang Smith's work uh, has been in many ways, my answer to the meaning crisis, right? And I see, feel like my adult life, I mean, as long as I can remember uh, being a thinking, you know, person, right? <laughs> of the age of reason, is that what they say? Uh, meaning has been a big um, concern. You know, I went to Berkeley, as you mentioned, I studied mathematics and mathematics is a beautiful field. Um, it's, a, it's a very solitary field <laughs> and um, it doesn't really uh, solve the meaning problem on its own, right? And then, um, but, you know, met, encountered a lot of ideas at Berkeley, got into a number of different um, kind of spiritual pursuits along the way, including 12-step stuff, Native American stuff, uh, meditation, et cetera, right? And other things which will remain unsaid, right? But uh, those didn't answer the meaning problem, went and got my PhD in system science. So system science is supposed to be in the academy, this kind of space where uh, you do interdisciplinary work and it's not so reductionistic. Um, there's the idea of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, right? What are these holes that in life that's, that are so important to us right, and yet are so like inexplicable to uh, through kind of our modern way of knowing, right, through science, through analysis, through data, they don't ever get us to the holes, right, the WHO LES. <laughs> and, um, but system science, um, although it was a lot of fun, um, you know, studying neural networks and genetic algorithms and artificial intelligence. I worked in an area called artificial life, where it sounds like Frankenstein, but that's, you know, I mean, in some ways it is, I guess, because you are, uh, you know, we would write computer programs that try to set up life-like conditions, such as, um, you know, foraging and a metabolic tax and mating. And how do you kind of take these you know, things that nature does, right? And uh, turn them into algorithms and see if you can identify emergent behavior. And, um, you know, it was fun, but it never produced anything. <laughs> there was no emergent behavior. You know, there were no answers to why are holes 
greater than the sum of their parts? Are wholes greater than the sum of the parts, right? And these are questions that people have been thinking about for a long time. So, um, you know, I decided not to go into academia uh, after finishing my PhD. I wanted to do stuff in the real world, so to speak. I became an entrepreneur. My dream was to like build my own research lab, essentially, and try to work at, you know, the interface of um, theory and reality, whatever those two things are. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to talk more about that later. <laughs> and, uh, and then a few years ago, I um, encountered the work of Wolfgang Smith. I saw his, the film about his life, uh, The End of Quantum Reality. Uh, that started to draw me in. And then I started to read his work. And then I reached out and said, how can I help? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And um, that started a couple years now of a very close working relationship uh, with Wolfgang and a much deeper understanding of his work. And, and then for me, um, you know, Wolfgang's work really settled the question for me of um, what are holes and parts right? <laughs> and, and can we ever kind of get the ultimate answers out of this kind of deductive, reductionistic, materialistic, analytical approach to understanding our world, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally concluded the answer is no. No, we can't get there. We can't get here from there, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We can't get here from there. Um, and, uh, you know, one other piece of it is, I was just mentioning this to a friend um, along the way. Uh, I've, I have gotten more um, deeply involved in the church and in Christianity. And in spite of like my, uh, you know, my experience prior to being involved in the church, um, a lot of, you know, spiritual traditions, let's say, from transcendental meditation to, um, you know, sweat lodges, massage, whatever it was, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so I had um, started to ask more questions about what is this spiritual tradition of the West, right? And, um, and so, you know, Wolfgang's work also for me was, uh, the way I've put it before, is that it kind of let my head catch up with my heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I think that's an important topic, you know, uh, because I think that Ultimately, the resolution of the meaning crisis um, is a religious question. You know, I know a lot of people don't see it that way, but I, I see it that way increasingly. Mm -hmm. I think that we are all religious by nature and to pretend that we're not religious and that we don't have a religion, <laughs> even though it might not be, you know, a formal organized religion or a religion with history. Um, I think that's a really important question for us all to be asking. And once I kind of made that conclusion, um, I realized that our own kind of religious traditions in the West, right, even though I had been attracted to and involved with a lot of Eastern traditions as well. As did Wolfgang himself, there's another connection between us. You know, he had to go to India and meet uh, sadhus, Hindus, wise men, right? Who were really demonstrated to him that there are other realities than the one that kind of the consensus reality that we all, you know, live in here in the West, right? Um, and uh, 
But then to really go, well, look, our tradition has been around for 2000 years plus now. What's the, what, what wisdom is embedded in our own spiritual history, spiritual traditions here in the West? And I think that reconnecting with that um, is an important part of the conversation because I know it's hard for so many thinking educated people to really um, connect with the West's spiritual heritage at this point. And uh, so that's just a little bit of background and, um, and also why Wolfgang Smith's work was so important to me that I was um, you know, ultimately willing to become president of the foundation and to get his work uh, out to a wider audience, right? And to be responsible for stewarding um, his work and, uh, and his ideas and helping to others to connect with them and, and build on them. And contemporaneously with this work that you're doing for the Institute, you're also developing your own businesses. Um, do you wanna talk about yeah. those a little bit? Uh, sure, I write uh, on my views about particularly finance and technology, but it's related to meaning, the meaning crisis as well, you know, because I mm -hmm. see a lot of uh, narrative manipulation going on in uh, the economy, right? And the media and technology, et cetera. I see those as being kind of um, connected to Wolfgang's work also, because I see what's going on in these fields as being um, a product of the kind of disconnect that uh, science and the enlightenment has led us to. And we can get into that in the course of our conversation. So I write about some of that at drrichardsmith.com. I'm developing some financial technology at risksmith.com. And then I'm also chairman and CEO of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, which is an 80-year-old not-for-profit uh, foundation that helps uh, understand the world we live in through a, a, the lens of cycles. So I, I would be very interested in learning yes, about that. Yeah. So and it's actually connected to Wolfgang's work again, you know, because yeah. Is that a um, website, the study of yeah, cycles? Cycles, cycles.org. Just cycles.org. Cycles. Cycles. U-I-C-L-E-S dot O-R-G. And, and then, a lot of it has to do with markets and understanding cycles mm -hmm. in markets. You know, markets <clears throat> are a very, markets are a really fascinating arena, right? Going yes, back to my yes, interest yeah. in, you know, where's the interface between data and people? Mm -hmm. Um there's a lot of interface. Well, we've we've done <laughs> a number markets. of conversations here around von Mises work. And um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, there are a lot of connections there. And then my husband is is quite an avid investor and he shows me all these, ah, these well. um, anyway, a lot of the stuff that he shows me online just lines up with so many of these other things. And you yes. can see the Pareto principle operating. You can, you know, you can see all yep. of these. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's fascinating. So, so back up just a second, you, you mentioned drrichardsmith.com and then you said financial technologies at risk. Is risk, that R-I-S-K, Smith, riskmith.com. Oh. Risk mm -hmm. oh, so. S-M-I-T-H. So the, the, the website is riskmith.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. I thought it had financial technologies in there. So I just want to make sure I get it right for the description section risksmith.com. Um, so have you given any thought to the whole Bitcoin controversy? A lot of thought, <laughs> yes. So a number of people that, are, that watch this are kind of fans of Robert Breedlove and his, his work around mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin and money. And so- I'm Actually not familiar with his work. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the- description as well and you can take a look he's uh he's got a wonderful youtube channel so um what do you think about the bitcoin issue i think that the 
white paper of Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm -hmm. It was a landmark event. I think that most of what goes on around cryptocurrencies and digital, digital currencies is a sham. because it's mostly about uh, a kind of Ponzi scheme economy. Where I wondered, I wondered about that. <laughs> I mean, my intuition- Where it's really just about price and people are only in it because they think the price is gonna go up and prices only go up as long as, you know, somebody else is coming in behind you. Mm -hmm. And when you just focus on price, you are in a completely narrative driven, um, I don't know, don't want to call it consciousness, but narrative driven economy, you know? And um, ultimately, Bitcoin is only going to have value if it has an impact on the world and not just made a few people rich early on. Right. And then, uh, you know, is like a wealth transfer mechanism from the, you know, early birds to the late comers. That's not going to, that's, that's not value. Right. Mm -hmm. And I am troubled at the lack of real impact and value creation that I've seen so far. And meanwhile, I still think that in this digital world that we're all increasingly, you know, spending time in, my my real hope for Bitcoin is that it will be the basis of a digital self and a digital sovereignty. Okay, because you know the model that most technology companies are uh, monetizing right now is to like get our attention and get our time and ultimately like build artificial intelligence and do behavior modification to monetize us, right? To move mm -hmm. our attention to the things that profit them and not us, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't really have any um, like personal identity online. We don't control our own data. We don't have sovereignty over our digital selves. And this data is incredibly valuable, which is why these technology companies are so valuable, right? And they're able to do things with it that we can't, even though we're the ones you know, generating the data through our own actions, right? Our, our own data exhaust. So um, I do think that there is a, um, a place for um, Bitcoin to help create an internet where we have more control over our own data and over our own kind of digital identities and more mobility, right? More data mobility. So meanwhile, that's not, um, I don't really see that happening with Bitcoin BTC. You know, there's different versions of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that or not. There's yeah, 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 yeah. BCH and, and, and there's and, also And ESP. every little... Every little community has their own loyalty towards their particular version of it, right? And and their reasons why the other guy is wrong, and yeah. And so I sympathize with BTC Bitcoin, the original Bitcoin, and the sort of um, anarcho-capitalist aspirations or ideals of the people who are really committed to Bitcoin as a way of life. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They've got all their wealth in Bitcoin. They're trying to build a new economy around Bitcoin. Um, I think that's legit. I don't really think that BTC scales 
in the way that it could achieve what I'm talking about, which is to like use blockchain and digital currencies <clears throat> in order to give us more control over our online identities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> move away from the surveillance <clears throat> capitalism economy. I don't know if you're familiar with the surveillance capitalism thesis or not. Well, uh, Shoshana I mean, Zuboff the, is the one who wrote the book, right? Surveillance. I, I don't need. I don't need to read a book. the The title alone that you just said there it just pops into my head as yeah. a whole thing. I completely. Yeah, it's where you know about. humans yeah. are essentially uh, the product. You know, mm -hmm. we're the product. If you're not the customer, you know, if you're if it's free, you're the product. Well, we have and this power, natural. We have this natural affinity towards worship because there's is built into us to worship and so yes. there's this whole trying to capture our attention constantly yes. is an attempt to get us to be worshiping yes. what they want us to worship which is a, yes. a very powerful manipulative tool it's very powerful manipulative tool absolutely and um you know they are they want us to worship what is going to ultimately be profitable for them Right. Mm -hmm. And there there are literally market places, markets now in human futures. So there's futures markets in, uh, you know, wheat, corn, gold, <laughs> cattle. Right. Uh, and and financial what, what's futures. really what's really telling there is that futures are always in commodities. So what it's really doing is commoditizing humans if they have absolutely human it is. Yeah, absolutely yeah. it is. And it to me, you know, another connection to Wolfgang's work here. Wolfgang to me restores the primacy of the the individual human being, right, and gets away from this again mechanistic, reductionistic, materialistic view of life that says that, you know, at best, you know, we've got some subjective stuff going on in here, but we're all separate from one another. And uh, we're all just, you know, like, really no different than little amoebas, you know, pursuing their own sugar trails. And that is a very, uh, um, convenient metaphysics, let's say, if your business model is to manipulate the futures of people. And that's what the human futures marketplaces do. That's what Google and Facebook are. They are marketplaces of human futures. So they get paid by their advertisers, right? By well, primarily their advertisers in the case of Google and Facebook. And what they are offering are different paths, you know, of human futures. And how do they, what's the best way to um, give your advertisers the outcomes that they will come back for and give you more money for is to actually change your, the future of the users, right? so that they align with the outcomes of the advertisers. So it's very simple, you know, theory, right? And it's, it's plain as day, but it's not just, it's, it's not widely understood that that's what's going on, that these are marketplaces in human futures. And, uh, and you can really only do that if your view of what it means to be human, um, uh, is um, one where it, that that doesn't really matter, you know. <laughs> We're all. It just almost seems as though they've been cogs in the machine, and the yeah, internet and the metaverse is one big giant new level of of intelligence and consciousness, collective consciousness. No, no, this is not a liberation. This is a this is more a slavery than a liberation, and. The people who are who control the data, who control the, the server farms, who control the algorithms, they're creating the future, not us. And that's wow. something that we have to be acutely aware of. Um, and, and again, it's kind of the logical outcome and end of the historical journey that we've been on for the last few hundred years. 
um, which Wolfgang Smith's work illuminates very profoundly. It certainly does. And uh, I think one of the really dangerous parts of it is that, and, and I might not have parsed this exactly correctly, but it seems to me that they're utilizing by, by this um, idea that they can make us feel morally superior by pushing us along a thread of saying that there's some sort of utilitarian benefit to making certain decisions. And so, um, but, but it's this very utilitarian outlook that we can make things better and we can decide on what the better future looks like. And so then they develop- Not you and me, but the, uh, you know, our, our overlords. Well, I mean, the overlords are, are deciding <laughs> The overlords are convincing us that if we participate with them in their direction, that we're making right. a better world. Right. Right. That's and so that saying, gives yeah. everybody this sense of moral superiority. If I if I just yes. keep following this thread and then they feed back to us more information that kind of goes along with the way that that we have a bent anyway, and they feed this yep. information back and they keep yeah. us going down this path. Yeah. So now they've they've developed uh, this completely polarized society with two different perspectives but both of them work on in benefit of of their goals I <laughs> that's the thing reading, that i think, uh, think people big, don't understand right i'm a big fan of ben hunt over at epsilon theory he writes a blog there i haven't haven't heard of that i'm gonna have to look that up and he just put out a piece today on uh the uvaldi you know oh, event, the texas right? event uh-huh mm -hmm. And um, one of the things he showed was that I think it's, you know, it was some recent research from Pew Research saying uh, something like 80% of Republicans now think that uh, Democrats are bad people and don't have any American, traditional American values. And 80% of Democrats think that Republicans are bad people. Yep. And don't have, don't share any of their traditional American values. Right. Right. So that divide uh, is unbelievable, you know, and, and we can all feel it. You know, I'm sure we all feel our own position in there and that temptation to, mm -hmm. you know, make it an us against them to participate in that us against them narrative. Right. Yep. And uh, that only serves, uh, you know, ultimately the power <laughs> brokers yeah. in the Democrat and Republican party, right? And that's just politics. It's the same, you know, in other fields too. Absolutely, yeah. It's and the same so, problem all the way through. It goes all the way down. Yeah. So that is, um, yeah, that's it's a big problem. And that's, that's what's going on. And it is something that we have to be really careful about. Well, so you said, you mentioned something the other day to me when we were having a conversation that, that in your own life, one of the things that has recaptured a lot of beauty for you is uh, going through the, the liturgical calendar. Mm -hmm. And um, would you like to talk about that a little bit and how that kind of restores the vision for you? Well, I think that again, this Christian heritage in the West, right, that we are the beneficiaries of is a very important resource for us to reconnect with. And so um, I'll share just a little bit of my own experience. Right. Over the past few months in particular, we've been going through Lent and then, um, uh, you know, this period after, then we get to Easter, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, we have this period of um, Christ being arisen and on the earth for 40 days. And uh, then we have the Ascension. And then we have Pentecost, where the Holy Ghost comes down 
and uh, illuminates 120 souls that were in the cynical um, awaiting the Holy Ghost, right? So, you know, in that story, right, we are, we are story-based creatures, right? Mm -hmm. We have to have a story. We have to have a story, you know? I don't care who you are. You have a story. We all have stories. And we get meaning by participating in story. And so when I look around at the stories that are being told, you know, uh, I think this is an incredible story. And it's an incredible story in which we can have our own personal journey of growth by tapping into the wisdom of that story, right? So just for me personally, like going through Lent, for example, and fasting, giving up something. Making a commitment to pray, let's say, right? On a regular basis, right? It's like a sacrifice. And it's a time of privation. And then, and I don't, you know, where else do you get that? Maybe if you're like an athlete or something, you private, you know, or even an entrepreneur, there's a certain privation in order to achieve a certain outcome, right? But to go through a period of, you know, uh, of sacrifice and discipline, you know, even in a simple way, right? Then when you arrive at Easter, it's a totally different experience. Like you kind of, you gave something up, you sacrificed something during that considerable period of Lent, you know, it's not trivial, especially if you make a serious sacrifice. For me, it was as simple as like giving up coffee, right? So, you know, then you get to Easter and now you're participating in that story. And um, that has been an incredible framework. And there's so much uh, profound writings from over the years of other people who have really you know, participated in this tradition and shared their wisdom and their experience um, that for me have been just incredible uh, aids in terms of tapping into this Christian tradition and this Christian spiritual path in a way that I never would have thought possible. Yeah. Um, and even simple things like the seven deadly sins and the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. Okay. So last week, you know, Pentecost happened a week or so ago and, um, it's the octave of Pentecost, okay? So, you know, the, there's the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost and one comes up a day, fear of God, godliness, uh, knowledge, fortitude, counsel, um, wisdom. And that's a language, right? And a story which gives us a chance to explore these important themes, right? And then consider that versus, let's say, the story that if I just pop up, you know, one of my five web browsers on one of my three screens, what story does Google and Facebook want me to engage in, right? So do I want to engage in this modern story, right, that clearly is kind of manipulating me for economic ends? Or do I want to figure out how to tap into the 2,000-year history that we have, that is our spiritual heritage in the West, right? So I think that, you know, to me, this is another really key part of my interest in Wolfgang's work. How do we reconcile our modern world, you know, and modern science and technology, et cetera, with our Christian heritage? 
and how do we bring those two back together? Um, I think that's culturally something that's absolutely got to happen. And uh, I don't think it's going to be easy. You know, I, there are obviously huge problems in organized religion. Um, but, uh, you know, another thing about church is that it happens. It's a spiritual life with other people, mm -hmm. right? And for me also just being a father, right? And having children, it's a language in which I can have spiritual dialogue with my children. And I can have a spiritual relationship with my wife, you know? And if there's kind of one main, you know, direction of the modern world that I see, it's that everybody's separating, right? Everybody's going to their own corner. We've all got our devices. We've all got our own, you know, we all got our own news feeds. We don't even read the same things anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> And uh, we're all going to our own corner. And when we're all separate and alone, we are more easily manipulated. We're more yeah. easily controlled, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, man, it's just amazing how this tradition of church and the spiritual language and wisdom uh, is something that you do together, right? That you go worship together. And that's a totally different experience than I've, than I've had in my other uh, spiritual pursuits, you know? They were much more solitary, you know, uh, um, experiences. So I think that we have to find a way to come back together more to gather more, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the more that I go more deeper into the church and its liturgy, um, the more opportunity I'm finding to do that. Well, you mentioned that there's a, there are some problems with the church today, the institutional church, which, which is certainly true. Yeah. I mean, for me, at the end of the day, it is Jesus's church, and he is fully capable of keeping things together. <laughs> you know, yeah. we can mess things up, but he's always at work in each of us and in his body. And um, and one of the, the highlights that I see that's happening, you know, I know that I typically attend what you would roughly call an evangelical church. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of problems in the evangelical church, there's no question. But yeah. The, the biggest movement that I see happening in the last 20 years that has been very beneficial is the idea of trying to get everybody in the church as much as possible to get involved with a small group of some kind. Mm -hmm. where you gather together with people that you don't necessarily have anything in common with, but, mm -hmm. but you learn to support each other, encourage each other, be there when you know somebody is falling or mm -hmm. has some sort of a problem yeah. or trouble, and you learn to love one another, and you learn to live out the gospel in a community and then when you go to church on sunday you know people and you can talk to them at the service and it can make yeah. you feel more connected to the whole body and um right. and then eventually the church has events together where maybe we go out and serve the community and so then we get that service together serving the community and and that i think is um regardless of what weaknesses of what might be happening on Sunday morning, Christ is at work in each of us in those small groups and in those community service events. And, and, uh, and doesn't it mitigate the meaning crisis? Yes. Yes. Very much so. And um, why, so why are so many of us afraid of participating in it? Why is it such a taboo thing? to even talk about it, you know, especially if you've been in, got, you know, four to eight years of college degrees behind you, right? 
Well, isn't it easier to love the world or to love humanity than it is to love a single person who's right in front of you with all their foibles and all your foibles, you know? Yep. I mean, I think that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, I once heard it, I once heard it called bark to bark. We're bark to bark. And so like on a tree, you know, Mm -hmm. we're only touching at the bark level. And in order to get to get beyond that, you have to let the bark off. And that's a very scary thing. The so picture me, I like the best is the one from The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis, where Eustace has is, is been, been captured by kind of, he's become this dragon and he's, you know, just completely constricted by this dragon skin and he's trying to get this dragon skin off. It's very hard to peel that stuff off and it's very painful and very scary. And that's what it means to unite with other people. Um, and get to know them in Christ. It's peeling off the dragon skin, you know, letting mm-hmm. Christ peel off the dragon skin. Right. Yes, that that's key because like that idea that um, it's not us doing it ourselves, right? We don't merit it. Mm-hmm. We just have to be open to it. Yeah. Right. We have to want it. That is, you know, um, that in and of itself, that idea of grace is such a powerful um, catalyst as opposed to us thinking that we have to do it, right? That we have to Mm -hmm. meditate for a certain number of hours a day or, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, that was always kind of my approach to spirituality. Like I'm going to do it, right? (laughs) And uh, so I think that that aspect of Christianity and the role that Christ plays as a spiritual catalyst, as a, you know, and ultimately as a source of grace and the Holy Ghost, again, these are very powerful ideas that have been in our culture for a couple of thousand years now and been the basis of our culture, really, you know, and we can't afford to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We have to understand and integrate these things into our modern lives. So um, well, I'm, and, I'm wondering if we can pull back, just pull up a level to the yeah. whole scientific level of Wolfgang's yes. idea of vertical Perfect. causation here. Yep. Because one of the things that, that has occurred to me for quite a while um, and I've been trying to write about it, but Wolfgang gives me some more language to use around that. Mm-hmm. And that is the idea that that this movement of grace or love on the part of Christ is very much like, it's going to take me a second to flesh this out. So let me mm-hmm. just ramble here for a minute. Wolfgang's idea of vertical causation, that from this, this transcendent point of the of eternal, well, actually, he, he goes one level above that, actually. But from the ebb eternal, there is this vertical causation that comes to the, um, the physical world and brings the corporeal element into being. And would that be a correct way to say that? That there's, it's an instantaneous move that brings the physical yes. into the corporeal. I'm not sure about bringing the physical into the corporeal. Those are kind of technical terms, okay. right? Okay. Uh, certainly that creates the corporeal. So okay. we should give a little basic introduction to Wolfgang's terminology and ideas here. Yes, right? and, I, and I want you to do that. Let, let okay. me just finish the thought here though. Yep. That this, this instantaneous move, he talks about the observer, right? Mm-hmm. In, in, the, in uh, the quantum mechanical language, the observer is observing the the wave field and then when when the observation happens the wave field becomes a particle right. and that the quantum mechanics can't answer the question of where the observer is because they're looking for the observer on the physical level but the, the observer has to be one level up right. or maybe many levels up but that moment of well, there's two things here. One of them is that when you think of the observer that way, when you think of the observer from the 
the scientific viewpoint. The observer is very much a sterile, mechanical, um, even, even if you think of it as a person, it would be more like one of the watchers in the fringe or something like that, where they're observing mm -hmm. and taking notes on everything. Right. But there's no connection between the observer and the thing being observed. Mm -hmm. But when Christ interacts, when Christ brings reality into being, it's not a sterile mechanical observing for any ulterior motive or any weird intention or anything like that. It's a mm -hmm. relationship. It's a relationship of grace and love that brings transformation, that brings insight, that brings things into being. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I wanted to just explore that idea, but through the mm -hmm. lens of, of Wolfgang's vertical causation. So now mm -hmm. let's go back and talk about it technically from his perspective as a philosopher and physicist. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the idea of vertical causation came up as a resolution for Wolfgang of the quantum enigma, mm -hmm. right? So the quantum enigma is that we have this quantum mechanics and um, it gives these waveforms and it gives these incredibly uh, accurate predictions, right? But nobody understands quantum mechanics. Nobody's ever been in the quantum world, right? And so we can detect quantum particles, right? But that detection happens from some kind of device built by a person mm -hmm. who has engineered the experiments and manufactured the device, right? That then detects the particle. And when you're detecting the particle, it's the wave function collapses, right? Because the wave function is really a probability distribution, mm -hmm. right? That says it may be, wait, you know, the particle could be here, or it could be here, or it could be there. And as soon as you uh, make a measurement, that wave function collapses, the probability distribution disappears, right? And you mm -hmm. get a particle. And so, and science can't explain what this wave function collapse is, right? What causes it? And Wolfgang said, it's caused vertically it's caused instantaneously it's caused by the measuring device in this case mm -hmm. and so that idea of instantaneous causation that doesn't happen in time right that mm -hmm. can't be explained in a scientific manner of like three dimensions of space and one dimension of time right space time is an inescapable, uh, what? It's an inescapable reality. It's an inescapable fact that we have this vertical causation, this um, instantaneous causation in the universe, right? As demonstrated by the quantum enigma. And so that opens up a whole new, you know, set of questions about what is this vertical causation? Where does it come from? Right? What is this power? And, um, and it gets us out of this, uh, you know, limited understanding of what meaning is, what being is, etc. right? that is all trying to be framed in the language of the horizontal mechanisms of space-time, right? So that's where the idea of vertical causation arose. And yes, it connects very beautifully with many of the wisdom traditions of the West, right? Mm -hmm. And with this idea of, of God and Christ, as um, powers that can act and create out of time, right? And that aren't like distant, uh, you know, beings who maybe set up the universe in the beginning and then, you know, let it unfold in the kind of clockworks sense, 
no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. My personal but belief is that we are, everything is being created in every moment. Well, it says in Colossians that in him, all things hold together. And, and other translations of that Greek word hold together are consist in him, all things consist. And mm -hmm. another translation might be cohere yeah. in him, all things cohere. Yeah. And it's basically the idea that he is at all times knitting all things together in every moment. So, yes. And once you, you know, to me, what Wolfgang has shown is the kind of um, reductio ad absurdum, right? <laughs> that uh, of where the scientific approach to knowledge and understanding has taken us, right? It is a valid form of knowing, but it can't explain everything. And the quantum enigma is kind of the breaking point where you realize that no, this can't be explained, you know, and, and we've known about this problem for a hundred years now, right? The quantum enigma, the measurement problem, the collapse of the wave function, and there's never been an answer to how this happens, right? And now there's attempts to try to explain the measuring device in terms of quantum mechanical uh, terms, right? How can you describe the whole system of the measuring device and the wave function in terms of quantum mechanical terms. And it can't be done, right? It's well, been a hundred years. This, there's, this, um, there's this desire to make everything horizontal because if you can bring it all down to the horizontal causation level, right? first of all, I mean, that's been the product of the enlightenment is to bring everything down to the horizontal and take away from us the vertical. Yes. Because if they can do that, then we're all unmoored and we're all separated. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a very convenient way to control people. But the way we see it manifesting, I think, especially in the last, I've seen it a lot in the last 40 years of my life, mm -hmm. is this idea that... Um, we can find our own solutions on this horizontal track. And so that's one of the reasons that we've become so um, polarized as a people and separated and everybody has their own idea. You get into postmodernism where there's no solutions to anything, there's no categories because we're all trying to come up with our own values and our own ideas of how to do things. And I'm gonna be, you know, me, it, it, it's all okay. this horizontal thing, but yeah. in, in a, in the beautiful picture of the church, the vertical and the horizontal work together because this is our relationship with God and this is our relationship with our neighbors. So we love God, we love our neighbors and it's all connected and comes together at the cross. And if you try to just have the horizontal with no vertical, then there's no center. There's nothing to center ourselves around, right? There's no Absolutely. focus. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and the vertical I, and, has essentially been denied. Yes. Right? Yeah. For millennia now. And that, you know, so another one of the core ideas that Wolfgang introduced is this idea of the corporeal versus the physical, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> That's probably the first idea that anybody who wants to understand Wolfgang's work has to understand. And so that dates back to Descartes and the idea of the Cartesian bifurcation. Mm -hmm. And Descartes famously said that there are kind of two categories of knowing. One is res extense, which are things of extension, things that we can touch and measure, right? And then there's res cogitans or cogitans, which are things of the mind, things that I think, you know? So I think, you know, Descartes has famously said, I think, therefore I am, right? But, uh, but he made a distinction between res extense and res cogitans. And res extense being the things that we can touch and measure and that have extension, right? And, uh, and, you know, while I don't think that Descartes was a bifurcationist himself, he actually, um, you know, did have religious uh, ideals. 
Um, that idea kind of started to move through history, right? And Galileo and Kant in particular really developed that idea into what today we'd call rationalism and the scientific method. But in that those things only deal with the res extense, with the things of extension, the things that we can measure, right? And so the meaning crisis <laughs> has its origins in the fact that we've set aside everything that we regard as meaningful, you know, our thoughts, our feelings, um, that the things of the mind, the things of the heart, right? We're gonna set those aside, go, well, we can't measure them. So ah, let's just not talk about them for a while. And then eventually they become second-class citizens and they become like unreal. And we're trying to recreate the res co cogitans out of everything we've learned about the res extense, right? So this idea of bifurcation is the first idea to understand that that's what science does, right? It bifurcates the world into things that can be quantified and measured and things that can't, you know? And while it doesn't come out right and say the things that can't be measured, you know, all the things that have to do with meaning, like love, care, wisdom, et cetera, right? That those are, well, you know, I'm just gonna put them in this too hard bucket over here. Well, so, isn't it also the idea that all of those things are only in the mind? Yes, right? That they're and not, the mind they're is not just in, a computer, right? Yeah, that they're not inherent in the thing itself. Yes. But I think what Wolfgang is saying is that the qualities are inherent in the thing itself. Yes. The beauty is in the object, not in the beholder. Yes. And yeah. reality is in the object. The rose yeah. is red. Mm -hmm. And the redness is in the rose, right? So he calls this the corporeal world, right? The corporeal mm -hmm. world is the you know, corporeal meaning body, right? Corpus, mm -hmm. um, all the things that we are and that we can touch, et cetera, right? That we, that is the real world, right? Versus the physical world, which he originally defined as the world as seen by the physicist, right? So I still struggle with that um, name a little bit because I tend to think of the physical world as being things I can touch, you know, but the yes, physical yeah, it, world it does require kind of a re-identifying is this redefining. idea of the world as conceived by the physicist, which is kind of the world stripped of qualities and reduced to pure quantity. So a cl clarification here. So the world is conceived by the physicist. That would include both the classical physics and the quantum physics. Well, Wolfgang is in the process right now of saying something new about that. Okay. <laughs> um, which uh, he's publishing, he's working on a new book. And uh, he regards this as the capstone of his work in physics. So I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag without Wolfgang doing it himself. Do we but, have an uh, idea of when it will be published? It, it should be within the next couple of months. Oh, that's tremendously exciting. It, yeah, it is tremendously yeah. exciting. And he's tremendously excited about it. And he's seen some things recently that, uh, you know, he was starting to see them over the past couple of years, but it finally just really clicked into place for him. And um, it's sort of the, uh, um, the, the follow-up book to the quantum enigma, which mm -hmm. is the book where he first introduced vertical causation and the, the idea of kind of the physical world, the, the world as seen by the physicist, right? Mm -hmm. And that physics is really the science of measurement, right? It's not mm -hmm. like, it's not the basis for understanding life in the world, right? <laughs> it's the science of measurement. And I it's like a that. wonderful science, you know, and one of the beautiful things about Wolfgang is he, he loves physics and, you know, and he thinks it's a, um, a disservice to physics to try to uh, burden it with the task of solving 
you know, the mysteries of life. And it's not up to the task. It's well, that's one of the things the I've, that's one of the things I've noticed recently is that we've become as people so um, willing to kind of bow down to the physicists as some sort of priestly class. They are I mean, the priestly class. Yeah, that's when exactly you see what's some of these going on. YouTube personalities like Lawrence Krauss no. or um, <clears throat> and you take some of the these other theories. guy, Don Hoffman, and some of these guys, and, and they're just no. people are so enamored of them and they follow them just the way they would follow a a, a famous preacher or something. They've like that. become exactly what the you know original physicists said they were out to undo, you know, which is the priesthood. Mm -hmm. They've become the priests. Mm -hmm. And I experienced this myself when I was getting my PhD, Karen, you know, I'm doing this PhD in system science. I'm learning all these fancy methods, you know, neural networks, genetic algorithms, um, you name it. Right. And I'm a systems thinker. And where I could see this going is that somehow I'm going to be the new high priest that's going to solve everybody else's problems with these technologies and these processes and these methodologies right and i was like no you know i am not interested in that i don't want that i don't want to be the priest you know i don't want to be like the one who supposedly has all the answers that nobody else can understand you know i don't want to be part of the tyranny of the experts and uh but that's exactly where science has arrived as some kind of priesthood and that we're all supposed to just trust the science now and take the word of the scientists. And meanwhile, so much of what goes on in the scientific world today is big budget, infinitely complex, you know, not reproducible by anybody but the scientists. And so, you know, they've become the priests. And uh, you've probably heard the saying, politics is downstream of culture, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Rick Delano, who was the, the man who made the movie about Wolfgang the Quantum Reality and helped, was a co-founder of the foundation, famously said, culture is downstream from physics. And that's what we have today. We have culture downstream from physics. That's how you can have companies like Google and Facebook who have made markets in human futures because they believe that it's all just physical. They don't believe in spirit. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the sanctity of the human individual and the sovereignty of the human individual. They believe that everything's manipulable, you know, and it's just about getting the most you can for yourself and uh, the individual soul isn't a thing that they have to really give consideration to. Mm -hmm. And that's culture that is downstream from physics. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have in our world today. And it's not serving us. So yeah. the physicists would just stop trying to pretend that they're God. We can have a much more humane world and a much richer, more beautiful physics. It, well, it, it seems to me that it's not just physics, but the internet is trying to convince every individual that they're God. Absolutely, they are, because, yeah. you know, then we're all perfectly atomized. Yeah. And, uh, and separate, and we can be moved to wherever we need to be moved. And we can each have our idea of how things ought to be. Yep. And expect everybody else to get in line and accept our vision of how things ought to be. And have no relationships. Yeah. Right. Um, have no love. Yeah. Right? It's really, I, did you ever read pleasure? the great, you ever read the great divorce by C.S. Lewis? Yes. Yeah. So it's that whole picture of what hell looks like. Everybody Absolutely. is so far divorced from each other that, that they can't even see the, the next house in the distance because they can't right. belong together. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that's the world we're living in today. Yeah. And it's a disaster. You know, families are separated. I mean, these vaccines, you know, now you have families divided along the lines of vaccinated and unvaccinated. 
mm-hmm. and wondering if they can even be together in person, right? Mm-hmm. How devastating is that? And I mean, this is going on in my own family and I feel it. It's terrible. Well, because, because the news media has generated the controversy and the news media has generated the fear and um, it's not just that topic, but all the topics that are out there today are separating families. I mean, yeah, I. So um, there's one more of, of Wolfgang's distinctives that we might want to cover before we, and I think we're kind of getting on that right now is this idea of irreducible wholeness. Mm-hmm. And so what is his perspective on that? And uh, how does that fit into what we've been talking about? So we've talked about the idea of bifurcation, right? And the idea of the corporeal, meaning the real world that we live in and participate in. It mm-hmm. is real. It's not just a computer simulation, right? It's, there's red in the rose and the mystery of perception that's happening there. It's not explainable in terms of kind of physical type causes. It's actually a vertical, an instance of vertical causation. Vertical causation was first um, uh, proposed as a resolution of the quantum enigma, right? So this idea of vertical causation of instantaneous creative causation. These are the kind of two pillars of Wolfgang's work up until now. And then this idea of irreducible wholeness is kind of the new third pillar of his work. He's been talking about it some. He talks about Dimsky's theorem, for example, Mm -hmm. um, that uh, horizontal causation cannot produce complex specified information. In other words, horizontal causation cannot produce irreducible wholeness. So irreducible wholeness is that wholeness that is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? Mm-hmm. It is an inescapable reality of our world, right? Uh, science is not going to ever create life, may be able to mimic life, but life itself is an irreducible wholeness. And um, a rock is an irreducible wholeness. It is not the sum of its parts. It's not a collection of particles. It's an irreducible wholeness. So Mm -hmm. that idea of irreducible wholeness, which is something that physics can't understand, right? Because horizontal causation cannot produce irreducible wholeness, right? You Mm -hmm. can't have monkeys on typewriters generating Shakespeare. It's it's, It's not true. It's never been done and it's a complete hypothetical, right? That's put out there as just a way to deny irreducible wholeness. No, a Shakespeare sonnet is an irreducible whole. I don't think even Shakespeare could have produced a sonnet by starting out with word by word by word by word. It could not have been produced horizontally. It has, to, it has to have a shape inside his head before he starts to work on it. Yes, and right? where does that come from, Yeah. right? So these are the three ontological pillars, right? That there is a distinction between the corporeal and the physical, that the physical is kind of, you know, the world as the physicist perceives it, the world as can, that can be measured by the science of measurement, right? Mm-hmm. And there's the idea of vertical causation, of a causation that happens instantaneously, out of time, right? Not very quickly, right? (laughs) Not just in the blink of an eye, no. Instantaneously. It can't be explained in time, right? The, The wave function collapse in quantum mechanics happens instantaneously. It doesn't happen in a really short period of time. It's instantaneous. It's vertical causation. And then this third ontological pillar of irreducible wholeness, which that's what Wolfgang's new book is really going to um, go into and illuminate. So if the quantum enigma was really the book about vertical causation, 
this new book is really the book about irreducible wholeness. So, um, so and if we use those three ontological ideas mm -hmm. to try to better understand our world and make sense of our world, right? Going back to the meaning crisis, the sense-making crisis, you can't make sense. Sense doesn't happen at the horizontal level. Sense is something that happens out of time. It happens instantaneously. It, is, it exists at another ontological level than this level of measurement and um, space-time. Well, so, so speaking of that, it, I, I can't remember exactly where I saw this in one of Wolfgang's books, but he, he had a discussion of the now. Yes. Do you remember that? Could you just speak yes. into that? Because I think that's very pertinent to this point of instantaneous. Well, I think there's this idea, I don't know if it's from Augustine or Aquinas, of the nunc stands or the now that stands, mm -hmm. right? And that ultimately, we just live in the now. The only thing that exists is the now, mm -hmm. right? And that now is a eternal creative process, right? It's a, it's, it is, it's what I said earlier, like, as I understand it, the world is being created anew in the now, in the now, in the now, mm -hmm. in the now, right? So yes, like that is ultimately where this takes us to well, and the that, now. That, that's why it's so important where we put our attention yes. because we only have the now. So if my attention is diverted to the internet or, you know, Into Twitter imagination. Or, you know, or Google or something like that in the yeah. now, then I'm mm. missing this creative moment of the now of what Absolutely. my my place in God's universe is, my purpose in God's universe is being missed. If I'm misusing my now, I think. Yes, and if we use the now rightly, it's quite uh, magnificent and uh, kind of overwhelming, you know? And, and, you know, unless we're gonna be uh, monks, most of us have to live in the not now, <laughs> you know, to some degree to function and, and run our lives, right? But that now is where the, is where vertical causation happens. It's the source of irreducible wholeness and mm -hmm. it's beyond space-time, right? It's beyond horizontal causation. So maintaining is, that, that vertical connection is... Like and it's so the, super you know, important. I mean, you talked about the center of the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The intersection of the vertical and the horizontal. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the difficulties in our world and the power of the powers that be, mm -hmm. do you have hope? I mean, it's a big task yes. you've taken on at this foundation. And I want to say, first of all, that I think the interviews that you do with Wolfgang are just marvelous. The way that you can ask him and get him to open up about some of these things is really quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just applaud what you're doing. And I, it's very exciting for the future of how you can shepherd his reputation and his legacy so that these ideas can be carried on and, and gain in uh, credence and gain yeah. um, a wider accessibility to people. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yes, I do have hope. You know, I see a lot of green shoots, if you will, <laughs> you know. Um, but I also do think that we're in a time of um, upheaval. And I think that a lot of the social infrastructure uh, that we've relied upon for, you know, our lives is coming undone. And I see, what I see is a lot of kind of parallel society, if, if you will, being developed. Um, 
And so I think there's going to be a lot of turmoil and difficulty in the next 20 years and, uh, and pain, you know, I really do. But ultimately, I think that we always have hope. <laughs> and I think that, you know, it's kind of a healing process that we have to go through. You know, we're sick, right? Our society is ill. We're sick. And um, when you're sick, you know, you go, you have to go through a healing crisis. And so that's kind of how I see it about where we're at. And um, I personally am concerned it's, you know, or I, I personally believe it's likely to get worse before it gets better. So I'm going to recommend these books to everybody here. And I have all my notes here too. There's Cosmos and Transcendence, which is yes. just marvelous, was That's his first book that he wrote 40 years ago. And by the way, you know, that subtitle is key, Breaking Through the Barrier of Scientific Belief. Mm -hmm. That is really the essence of what the foundation, Philosophia Foundation, is about. Help people mm -hmm. break through the barrier of scientific belief so we can establish a culture that respects our humanity, our soul, and respects life right? And that physics, you know, culture, not a culture that's downstream from physics, that says there's only horizontal causation, there's only the measurable, you know, no, there's the measurer. And the measurer cannot be measured. We are immeasurable. The measurer is yeah. immeasurable. That's a beautiful word, immeasurable. You know? It certainly is. It's got a lot in common with infinite. <laughs> I, I, on, on the side, I've been doing a series of uh, kind of analysis videos using Piranesi as a springboard for talking about philosophical ideas. Yeah, and I'm not familiar book, with that. Oh, it's such a, Piranesi, so, well, so. Piranesi is a novel, but it's okay. filled with beautiful language like that, mm. with like immeasurable and, mm. you know, irreducible. Yes. And, and, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful book and it's completely exalting to God, but without specifically talking about god it is a marvelous marvelous yeah. text so Wonderful. so anyway so there's this book which yes. is in a new edition so that even though yes. it was written in 1984 so we're republishing been, all of wolfgang's books but this under is, the what foundation i'm saying is this has been editions. updated and revised so that it's yes. current even though it's an old book so you can yep. see the prophetic nature of what he was working on even back in 1984 yep and then there is this book Ancient Wisdom and Modern Misconceptions, which is also just a marvelous, Incredible. marvelous book. I, I had made a little note here of something that he wrote that I thought was so great. I'm just going to read it to let people know what a great book this is. Um, one thing more needs now to be said, having noted that the perceived entity is experienced as something transcendent. I wish to point out that it is by virtue of this very transcendence that the given entity presents itself as something more than a percept. It presents itself as an object. Transcendence proves thus to be the hallmark objectivity. And I thought that was so great because one of the things as an artist that I started to notice early on when I started painting is that a truly great artist has the capacity to take something that is seemingly insignificant and show the beauty of the object mm -hmm. and uh, so I was thinking about you know in the hands of an artist the proper kind of attention can produce the beauty of a crack in the wall or of a wizened old man or of a twisted dying tree mm -hmm. because the object itself if you look at it with the proper attention will manifest the transcendence will Absolutely. exhibit the transcendence right it's an and irreducible so whole in in wolfgang's books every single sentence can make you think thoughts like that so it's very I dense agree. and then the vertical ascent which is um this book where he talks more about the quantum is this kind of an update of the quantum enigma or uh, i'd say it's kind of a follow-on to the quantum enigma okay um it's it's uh, picking up where the quantum enigma left off, and it and, and it re uh, or it covers some of the same material that he covered more in depth in the quantum enigma. But the quantum enigma will be republishing that book um, probably in the next four months or so, 
hopefully sooner. Um, he's just getting this new book out first, and then we're going to do a new edition of the Quantum Enigma, which um, is his most popular book. Does it make a difference whether people buy the books on the Philosophia Institute Foundation website or whether they buy them at Amazon, or is it irrelevant? I know all the it, all of them are on Amazon. Yeah, I um, I don't think it makes that big of a difference, so it's fine to buy them on Amazon. Um, but it's also great to buy them from Philosophia directly, and it's uh, philos p h i l o s hyphen sophia s o p h i a dot o r g which is a marvelous resource full website. It's wow. got so many articles and writings from Wolfgang and wonderful vlogs of the two of you talking yes. together. And it's, it's just a marvelous resource. Beautiful. Yes, and where I see it website. going over time, you know, is that it becomes a kind of academy, mm -hmm. right? Where people can learn about Wolfgang's ideas, but where other scholars and other um, people can develop uh, their fields, you know, around these principles that Wolfgang has established and, and that we can all um, learn to see the world, you know, right side up instead of upside down. Is there a facility on those articles to comment and to get into conversations with people? There's not, but we're gonna be establishing a forum that would be members. so. That'd be so terrific. Um, there is a, uh, I think there's a Facebook group now called Wolf mm -hmm. Gangsters. That's not an official, <laughs> uh, you know, part of the foundation, but that's where a lot of people gather to talk about Wolf Gang's ideas. But that's yes, great. I definitely plan to establish a forum, and um, you know, where members of the foundation can dialogue on these critical issues. So do you have, yeah, you know, I know, like, for example, Ian McGilchrist, who is another writer that a lot of people here follow, mm -hmm. he established his own website and channel for people and has a forum on his website that people can join and it's a, <clears throat> kind of a monthly fee. Mm -hmm. Is it that kind of a, <clears throat> a monthly membership kind of a thing that you're going right to? Now it's an annual membership. Okay. I think it's like $40 or something. So. Not, oh, that's that's not substantial. <laughs> that's nothing. Yeah. That's nothing. Yeah. So is that um, that's on the it's on philosophia.org. Philosophia mm -hmm. And that there's but a the place forum to... isn't established yet. So that's coming, but it's not there right. yet. Yeah. So. Well, I'm eager for the forum to get started because I'd really like to talk about these ideas more with other people. And right. I would like to find somebody with the foundation who's interested in just throwing ideas around with me about um, Stephen Wolfram's new physics, because not, not as an actual picture of what physics is, but as a way of approaching some of these philosophical issues and, and finding a way into people's hearts, because I think there's yes. some very important well, things there. So just uh, a little plug for the foundation. If you do have any, if anybody does see this video that really wants to support the foundation, we are a 501c3 okay. not for profit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> If you make a donation uh, and say it's for the establishment of a forum, it'll help us get it done. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I'll do that instead of joining. And for helping to promote and disseminate Wolfgang's work. Uh -huh. That sounds great. And anything else that you want me to add into the show notes, just let me know. Sure. This has been so great, Richard. Thank you so much for giving me so much of your time and you, your thoughtfulness and uh, look forward to, to future to conversations that yes. either you or Wolfgang are going to have with John Verbeke and perhaps Stephen Blackwood and some others. And Yes. Looking so. forward to it too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.